So um, today I'll be talking about um, a review paper I read on continual learning in a reinforcement learning setting, um, which I thought was really interesting and made some good points. And um, yeah, the paper is called uh, Towards Continual Reinforcement Learning, a Review and Perspectives. And it, it's uh, by these authors um, and the link is here. And it's, uh, it's fairly high level. It doesn't go into like the technical details of like each algorithm, but it just kind of distills the main ideas of each one. So I think it's a, it's a good read. Um, so a lot of the content in this, in this presentation is based off of that. Is it just an archive uh, or is it, or is it uh, published in a journal as well? Uh, it's, I, it's just an archive for now. Um, it only okay. came out in like December. So okay. maybe it's uh, an version coming. Um, so before I get started with like the actual content, I thought it'd be good to just go over the basics, um, basic overview of reinforcement learning. Um, so the key structure in reinforcement learning is something called a Markov decision process um, called an MDP. So this kind of summarizes the, the world um, the agent lives in. So there's a state space S, an action space A that determines what kind of actions the agents can take. Uh, there's the environment dynamics, which are typically stochastic, and um, it's like a Mar it's a Markovian system. So the probability of the next state is um, defined, conditioned on the current state and the action that the agent takes at the current state. And then there's a reward function um, that is based on the state, the action, and what state is transitioned to. Um, and it's a it's a scalar number that the agent receives. And um, people like to call reinforcement learning learning via trial and error, because uh, this is like the classic diagram where there's an agent, it interacts with the environment, the environment gives it feedback uh, in terms of a reward and also transitions the, um, what the agent sees and observes. Uh, so this is like a, a simple example of an MDP. Um, so where, a, quick, a quick question. So the reward is that every step, every action has a reward? Yeah. Um, okay. In a lot of settings, the reward can be zero. So like there's a notion of like a sparse reward. Oh, okay. Reward. Yeah, I mean, because it seems, you know, in the real world, we don't have rewards for all of our actions. You know, it's, it, the reward can come much later. Right, um, right. Um, but so the question is, is this reliant on having rewarded every step or not? Um, so no, like you could have a zero, like the reward could be zero at most steps until you like achieve some desired goal state at that's like very long in the future. And then you'll- That's, what I, that's what I thought, but the picture suggested otherwise. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, this is like a dense reward setting where every step has some sort of reward. So um, like you could imagine trying to figure out how to act optimally within this MDP of different states. Uh, so in terms of reinforcement learning, um, the objective is to learn a policy, which is basically like a controller. Um, if you're familiar with like control theory, where you're trying to choose an action uh, based on the current state. And a lot of times this is stochastic. So it will like de determine a probability distribution over actions. And then you sample from that distribution. And uh, the objective function is this expectation, which is the expectation of the sum of rewards that you see throughout the lifetime as an agent. So this is usually sum from zero to infinity. Um, but there's this discount factor gamma. And this basically, um, modulates how much you care about the future versus the present. So typically this is like 0 0.99 or 0 0.999. So um, it weights the present a little bit more than the future, but not too much. But you could imagine if it was like 0 0.1, that means you're like super greedy and you only care about the present and not really the future. Um, several other important quantities that you might see when you're talking about reinforcement learning is the notion of a value function. Um, which basically quantifies how valuable a state is under like the, the under the kind of types of actions that you'll take from this policy. So it's the expectation of the sum of rewards with this discount factor gamma, but you're conditioning that on the current state. So given that you're in the current state, um, what kind of what is the expected reward in the future? Given also that you act using pi as your policy. And then Q function, which is very similar, except now you're conditioning both on the state and the action. So given that I'm in state S and I take action A, what is the expected reward that I receive um, when, when I'm acting according to this policy? Um, so there's two classes of reinforcement learning algorithms uh, broadly that, that um, people come up with. So model-based algorithms, 
explicitly try to learn the MDP structure. So they learn uh, the transition function or the reward function or, or both through trial and error. Um, and then once they have this model, there are a bunch of algorithms that using this model, you figure out how to learn uh, an optimal policy. So once you have the knowledge about the MDP structure, then you can plan on this MDP um, approximation that you've learned, and then you figure out what's the best way to act. Then there's model free algorithms, which don't learn the MDP structure explicitly at all. Um, they directly optimize the policy um, with that objective function. So things like they, some algorithms take the gradient and uh, of, the, of the objective and just kind of directly optimize the policy. And there's also another branch of algorithms called Q learning. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I won't like get into like exactly what these are, but those are just like the names of a couple of model free regimes. So uh, this is like another example where model based is like you have a model of the world, so like this map, and you're trying to plan on it. And model free is you've kind of associated um, certain states with whatever the optimal action is, and then you just take it without doing explicit planning on the MDP. Okay, so now that we kind of have the bare bone basics of RL, uh, we could talk about continual RL. In, in normal RL, I should say, um, usually there's like a very specific task that you're training the agent. So the, the famous examples are like Atari games. So uh, if, you're, if you're training the agent to really get good at Pong, you'll just let the agent learn on that Pong environment for a bunch of time steps. And eventually it kind of figures out what the optimal actions are. Uh, but if you stick this agent into something, some other random environment or another Atari game, it's going to crash and burn because it's never seen that before. So typically RL is like within a very specific task. Um, but in continual RL, um, to kind of model what actual agents would see, you need to generalize across tasks. So first you need a notion of what a task is. Um, there's two perspectives that the, uh, uh, that the review paper kind of talks about. The first is that the MDP itself is um, changing over time. Um, so if you have a task vector Z um, that specifies what the task is, then you have a specific MDP for that. So you have its own state space, its own action space, its own transition dynamics, and its own reward structure. So when the task changes, the actual MDP changes for the agent. The other perspective, which is probably what we experience as humans, is that the agent lives in a huge but stationary MDP, meaning its dynamics are fixed. So the, the physics are the same, but um, the agent doesn't observe most of the environment. And this is pretty natural for us to think about. Um, like the, the underlying physics of the world we live in remain the same, but from our perspective, things are changing all the time because we don't know um, aspects of the world. Specifically, we don't know how other humans are acting. We don't know underlying cause, causal relationships. So from our perspective, it looks like things are always changing. Um, the, the authors kind of argue, and this is a point that I'm not 100% clear on, that even though these perspectives seem to be at, at odds with each other, um, from an RL algorithm point of view, like solving one is complementary to solving the other. Um, and I think Perspective one from like kind of a developmental point of view for, for algorithms is easier to think about because you can design MDPs that change quite easily, whereas designing this kind of large but stationary environment is difficult. Um, so there's like a wide spectrum of continual RL that kind of um, increases in difficulty and this is the way they, the authors categorize that. Um, so the simplest so it goes from like simplest to hardest. So first you have something they call domain adaptation where your agent is trained on a very specific skill. Um, for example, like self-driving an autonomous car in simulation. And then now you need to adapt that very specific skill to a new environment. So a really good example of this is sim to real transfer where you have an agent that is trained in a simulator and then now you need to put it in the real world but like it's applying that same skill in the real world. So you just need to know how to adapt that. Um, the next is transfer learning. So um, transfer learning, what, what happens is there are multiple domains of deployment and it, the agent needs to learn different types of skills. 
um, and it also experiences non-stationary evolution. However, the, the key difference now is that um, there, there's a bunch of tasks, but each task has, each task has its own policy. So this is kind of simplifying the problem a bit um, by allowing the agent to kind of have a different policy for each task it sees. Another class that the authors talk about is um, along the lines of meta learning. Um, so there's like a meta training and a meta testing phase where the agent is basically learning how to learn. Um, so for example, like the classic thing is you, you want the agent to be able to generalize easily to um, new, new, new settings. So it basically learns how to best optimize the policy when it sees a new setting. Um, and then these last two are very closely related. Um, multitask learning is when the agent is basically in different domains with multiple skills and has a single kind of policy that controls it in all of these settings except the tasks it sees comes from an underlying stationary distribution. So there could be like a distribution that defines what tasks it sees, this distribution is fixed and the agent has to learn a policy to kind of solve all these. And continual learning where all of these, all of these different options are kind of turned on where you have different domains, multiple types of behavior that are required, a single policy to control them all and the underlying tasks um, and MDP is non-stationary. Hey, Kash, before we go on, I have a question about this one. Yeah. So I'm surprised at how um, complex the, the parsing of these different things is, uh, meaning, um, I guess the question I have is, are these well-defined research areas where there's people in each of these different buckets and they know that, or is this like more like, oh, this person suggested this and this person suggested that and this person, you know, are these like representing you know, one labs or one paper, or is it, are these really well-established domains inside of that there are multiple people working on these different groups here? And so they, these are pretty well-defined, um, like domain, there's, there's a, a lot of research in each of these fields. It's surprising um, that there's such variety, you know, it, it seems like, I, it just seems to me somehow you would have expected it to settle on a, um, you know, settle on a single direction or a couple directions or the, you know, uh, as opposed to having some, you know, here you've got five different overlapping some ways um, uh, methodologies. I mean, I just, it just, I'm just surprised by that. I, just, I don't know if there's any, anything else to say about it. You would have yeah, it, it is surprising. Um, but I think the kind of thought process is that like each has its own application. For example, like domain adaptation is more like real world focused um, but the rest are kind of incremental towards this continual learning setting. And this is- Oh, I saw, so that maybe that's one way of looking at it then, you're saying is that they're, they're maybe they'll want to get to continual lifelong learning and these are stages along the way. Is that, is that what you just su su suggested? Yeah, that's kind of how the authors put it. Like these are- um, Okay, that makes sense. Like these are subsets of e continual learning. Okay, right. because you know, in general, in any field of study, we, we all want to go to some sort of paradigm or a very limited number of them. Um, you know, you want to end up with a common solution to problems. And so if you said, oh, yeah, continual life only learning is the goal, and these are stages that people have gotten along the way to get there, that makes sense to me. Right. Um, well, okay. but, but it's, not, it's not just that, right? Like, like I said, like each uh, intermediate state has its own application, like especially in robotics. So even yeah. if I just have domain adaptation, some people just want to have domain adaptation because that works for their business case. I don't think every lab's trying to get to continual lifelong learning. Yeah. But you can see why it's confusing and it'd be difficult for practitioners. And um, it's certainly not, you certainly don't want to have a world where there's, you know, oh, there's 45 different types of AI we can use for something. You know, <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> you don't want to get there, right? Yeah. Um, okay. All right. It just helps me. I'm just surprised by it. And, and that's also like, this is a proposed taxonomy. Uh, I mean, this is a recent paper. I wouldn't say, you know, that really, I mean, it's, it's a way of, you know, putting things into buckets, but it's not the only way. Well, that's, that's my, was my first part of my question. Is this, is this a well agreed upon, everyone understands this taxonomy or is this like, well, here's how we're thinking about it right now. Um, and Akash said, no, this is really well understood. Everyone understands these things, but well, maybe it's not. Maybe someone else should have a different taxonomy, which suggests that it's more fluid. 
Uh, I'd say it's a taxonomy. Like I disagree with some things on this paper, like cryptography, cash, the way multi-test learning is defined, for example. But but it, it's it's a big research group, and uh, I mean it's uh, hmm. the ideas there make sense. But still, like it's one taxonomy. It still it doesn't seem that this is a. It just doesn't strike me a chart like this that this is a long-term taxonomy that will stick around. It seems like somehow people are going to figure out how to get to a single method of doing all this stuff, or maybe two or something. Okay, I just, I'll just leave it as it is. Ivan, uh, Ivan, I have a question about this. Can you go back one slide, please, uh, Kash? Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, so perspective two for me sounds a bit strange because you, you were, um, you're talking about the idea of you having a large MDP that's stationary because the laws of physics uh, don't change. But from a single agent perspective, if you consider there are other agents in the environment and this, those agents have free will, uh, the environment's always going to be non-stationary because I, can't, I can never uh, predict the actions of all other agents. So from the perspective of single agents, it's always going to be non-stationary. So the number two there doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, um, yeah, you're right. Um, the, the authors also point this out. So like from, from the perspective of a single agent, the MDP is always non-stationary, mostly because of uh, the presence of other agents and also lack of, of observation. But if you consider the entire MDP, including all the agents and everything, then it's stationary in that regard. Well, but, but, but their, their actions are gonna change, right? They're learning, how can it be stationary? Uh, be, like, I guess you can assume you know how the their actions change or something like that. Okay, so if you if you if you assume there is no free will, then yes, we can have a non-stationary MDP. But otherwise, I mean, if you consider they can learn, that means their policy is going to change. If their policy is going to change, then it's never going to be stationary, even if it's not just from perspective of a single agent. This that that's how it seems to me. Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, um, yeah, feel free to interrupt with questions. So this is, this is good. Um, so so there's, a, there's a section that I like in the paper that discusses why RL is particularly a good setting for continual learning. And um, it has a lot to do with like the objective function that the agent has to optimize for. So I, I kind of put it here again. So there's an explicit dependence on time here. Um, so the agent has to kind of weigh how much it cares about right now, the present and al also the future. And that's kind of determined by the this gamma factor. Um, and the assumptions that the agent has to make is that some portion of the future has to be similar to the past. Um, and the agent then has to learn, okay, how can I use my past experience to, to leverage, how can I leverage that past experience to act optimally in the future, to make predictions about the future? And then also how much should I just prioritize updating myself to act optimally on what I'm seeing right now. So because of this kind of trade-off that the agent has to make, it's a good setting to, to study the kind of classic problems that you, you come across in continual learning. So um, the, the big one being stability plasticity. Another big thing is that in supervised continual learning, there's no time dependence. So the agent has to like see, it, it sees new types of data, but there's no notion of time. It just kind of randomly, the, the types of data it sees just randomly switches without any sort of um, lead up to it. Whereas here, the observed data has an explicit time dependence. So the agent is kind of naturally evolving and then it can transition itself into a new kind of task or a new sort of goal that it has to solve. But it's, it's not gonna be as abrupt as it would be in supervised continual learning. Uh, because this is like a real world kind of um, evolving setting. So there's, it's a more natural setting in which to st study these problems. And there's also like more modes of um, relationships between the data that the agent can see. Um, the, the notion of time dependence is also a challenge in reinforcement learning, especially deep reinforcement learning, because a lot of times the kind of gradient descent assumes that you have IID data, but now you have like time correlated data. So there's a lot of research on how, how to deal with that as well. I mean, uh, the uh, um, reinforcement learning has the notion of 
an agent interacting with the world. So the, so the data that the agent trains on is decided by itself. So it has to determine what kind of data it collects in order to learn. So now I'll talk about um, at a very high level kind of three buckets of continual RL approaches that have that people are working on. And this is kind of how the authors decide to bucket, uh, put them into buckets. The first is explicit knowledge retention. Uh, the second they call leveraging shared structure. And then the third is kind of a meta learning view of learning to learn. Uh, so explicit knowledge retention is kind of referring to the notion of there's explicit parameters or explicit kind of data that um, the agent keeps throughout its lifetime and uses throughout its lifetime. So one way of doing this is shared parameters where the actual policy parameters are shared uh, across tasks. So like the very naive way to do this is to have like um, one policy doing everything without any sort of modifications or having different, having one policy that's composed of separate policies for each task. Um, another really common and kind of promising approach that the authors point out is learning a good shared representation of the environment that can be used across tasks. So this is like a very good, very kind of fruitful direction of research. Um, and then even having like one single representation that the agent uh, develops throughout its lifetime. Another way that researchers have tried to do this is to learn a prior on how much each parameter is used in the past for certain types of settings. And then using this prior to update those parameters in a corresponding way. So this explicitly kind of controls the uh, plasticity of that parameter. Akash, when you say like explicit knowledge retention, are, are, do you mean like we're using the same model or you're talking about some specific uh, form of memory? Um, so this is like, I think what the, the authors mean by explicit knowledge retention is the fact that there's like an explicit way to kind of share knowledge, um, share knowledge or parameters across, like throughout the agent's lifetime across tasks. Okay, and, and those can, can be either like in just sharing the same parameters of a model or also using some sort of memory-based approach or is that in a different category? Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's in the same category. So I think there's a little bit of, there's like a few other categories which I think could fall into this as well, like skill learning, which I'll talk about later. But um, I think this is more like explicit rather than, rather than that being more implicit. Okay. Thanks. Um, so distillation based, I'm not too familiar with this, um, but it's kind of the, the notion is that you use one kind of neural network as a target for another. So this, this, um, so you could have one neural network that's already been trained on a task. And then you use that one as like the update target for another. And this kind of keeps the updates conservative is the way the authors put it. Uh, I haven't read too many papers in this kind of regime, so I'm not very familiar with it, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of a direction that um, people have tried in the past. So it encourages stability because your updates are very conservative. So you're kind of very basing it off of some sort of past network structure that you've learned. Um, rehearsal based, this is what um, Lucas kind of touched upon. So um, a big concept in reinforcement learning is experience replay. So you store a bunch of past experiences in some sort of buffer or database and you use that uh, throughout your learning process to update yourself. So um, rehearsal-based methods kind of explicitly make modifications on experience replay. So for example, uh, figuring out like which experiences are the most important or like figuring out when to kind of forget or drop certain pieces of data. Because if you're a lifelong learning agent, you can't just keep adding data to your, to your database. You have to, you have to truncate it at some point. Another um, kind of related area here, which I think is really cool is generative replay, where instead of explicitly just storing your data, you kind of compress all that as you, as you learn into a model. Um, and then you can kind of use this to um, generate new experiences um, kind of synthetically rather than, rather than actually experiencing those. Uh, are there any questions about 
like any of this kind of high level approaches. There's like a list of papers that the authors talk about for each of these, so. I just find it interesting that those same categories, you can see in you know, like continual learning review paper that doesn't talk about reinforcement learning. And all those methods are also used in supervised learning, yeah. supervised continual learning. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's um, interesting. You're saying, so it's, none of this is unique to, re, to reinforcement learning, is that what you're saying? No, no. Like all those methods, they, they are used in, in supervised learning as well. Hmm. And they, it, it's, it's the same list, so it, it's actually really interesting. So, so in some sense, you're saying not taking, not really taking advantage of the fact that you've got time or anything like that. You know, so it's... Yeah, that, that's a good way of putting. It. Yeah. And Lucas, um, I think in the other one, um, in the in the other review paper for just regular um, supervised learning, this everything that's um, shown on this slide here is actually broken up into two or three buckets, if if I remember correctly. I don't think everything was uh, in one bucket. Right, but they're the same technique, right? Like for each one of those, I can point out a paper in, in supervised learning. Yeah, I think like the kind of high level approaches, there's a lot of similarities between supervised and reinforcement, continual learning. But like within each of these, how this is done might differ um, based on this, the kind of setting it's in. And also like a point that the authors make that I don't explicitly talk about is the fact that any supervised continual learning problem can be modeled as a reinforcement learning problem. It, um, where like the state is just like your feature vector and then your action is like a prediction. Um, so the second kind of bucket that the, the authors talk about is um, leveraging shared structure. So one, one way is modularity. So you basically have a bunch of neural networks that um, each kind of maybe represent a certain mode of behavior um, or a certain type of skill or a certain, certain type of way of acting in a certain uh, state space. And then you need to figure out how to compose these modules or relate them in order to solve a certain task. Um, so there's like a really big challenge here, which is like, uh, they call it like a chicken and egg problem where you need, there's like a simultaneous learning of both the actual modules and how to combine them. So when you're learning to combine them, you, if you learn to combine them, then the modules will change at the next step. So you're kind of chasing something that's already moving. Um, but this is like an active area of research. State, abstra state abstraction is another, another area where you have, you, instead of using like the default state that, the, that you observe, you map it into a different state representation that is um, common across, that, that kind of captures things that are common across tasks and across settings that the agent has been in. Um, so these states should encapsulate like task agnostic shared state information that's important for the agent. Uh, another, another area that uh, I particularly like is skill focused. So this is kind of taking a hierarchical view on actions where if you're, for example, you're learning macro actions which, which control lower level actions. So if I'm like driving a car, I could take an action that says turn right. I'm not really thinking about the actual motor commands that my arm does in order to turn right. I just kind of think at a higher level of turning right. So learning to break, break apart um, decision-making points into these kind of higher level and lower level actions, and then using higher level skills that are common across tasks is like another approach that the authors point out. Um, so the, the kind of notion of a skill is that it's like a sequence of actions that are associated with reaching a particular state. And the challenges here are, how do you encourage skills that are learned, which can be reused throughout the agent's life? And also how can you uh, encourage the agent to kind of combine different skills rather than focusing on, on one. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the kind of recent approaches on skill-based uh, skill learning is like very information theoretic. So things like maximizing information gain in the state space and things like that. Um, a kind of related but different perspective is goal-focused. 
So um, you the agent determines like what its goal is at a current point in time. And once it determines this, it, takes, it can take a sequence of actions to, to achieve this goal. And the authors do a good job of kind of um, talking about how goal is like a kind of vague notion. So that's kind of a benefit because you can define goals in a many way. Um, it can be like a desired state, a desired reward, or even like a termination of a certain skill. So the policy is conditioned on the goal and um, a kind of exciting uh, direction is learning goals in an un unsupervised manner. So like the agent kind of through its interactions with the world um, learns a representation of like, okay, what are goals that are useful for me? And once I determine those goals, how can I take actions to achieve them? And this is done without like any sort of external, um, external thing uh, specifying that goal to the agent. And the last kind of um, thing here is auxiliary, auxiliary tasks, where this is something that Jeff mentioned uh, at the beginning, kind of um, augmenting the typical reward training signal with additional denser ones, denser meaning it, it's observed at like more frequent time steps to encourage the agent to learn about task agnostic dynamics of the world. Um, in the past, this has been like very much hand design. So you'd have like a domain expert, like a human being kind of engineering the reward signal to encourage certain types of behaviors that we know to be beneficial. Um, but like, of course we don't want to be, we want to kind of limit the amount of hand designing as much as possible. So another recent kind of branch of research has been you know, automatically learning these types of subtasks um, that the agent can pursue. Um, and this is also a promising direction. A quick question on the goals focus. <clears throat> when it says goals can be learned in unsupervised manner, is does that imply that there, it has some way of knowing the intrinsic value of, uh, of a goal that it comes up with? Yeah, so you need like the, as like an algorithm designer, I guess you need to come up with that notion of an intr intrinsic measure of how good a goal is. But it's usually related to some, something along the lines of like um, information theoretics. So like kind of how much information do you gain about the world using that goal or reward associated. Okay. It's, it says goals can be learned in an unsupervised manner. Uh, should I say like goals uh, can be used to learn in a supervised manner? Well, not exactly. So the goals- You're actually like, learning the goals, is that it? Yes, yes. And what does it mean to learn a goal? What are you learning? Well, you, like, um, so for example, if the notion of a goal is like a desired state, you yourself kind of, you determine, um, the agent has to determine what are good states to get to in, a, in, in an unsupervised way and achieve and get to those states. And then once it does that, it can like, when, when you actually give it like a reward or when you put it in a setting where there is a reward, it can determine, okay, what goal should I set myself that will maximize my reward? If that makes okay, sense. Okay, so you, you have to parameterize that in, in a certain way in order to be learnable, right? Yeah, exactly. So like okay. you, you could have something that generates the goal. It can be like a separate policy or something. Okay, and and if you have a if a goal means reaching a desired state, and mm -hmm. skill also is associated with reaching a particular state, in that case, is there any difference between skill and goal? Or is it the same thing? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think there's a very close relationship between goals and skills. I think there's like a there is a difference um, in most settings, and I think. Um, I need to look more into like how goal goals are learned. Uh, I'm not too familiar with that literature compared to skills. Could the distinction between uh, be between strategy and tactics? That the skill is 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 a tactical uh, how you achieve something, but the goal is something that's strategic. Um, I think it could be if I if I kind of understand what you're getting at. Um, there's, there's usually a distinction, um, <clears throat> not necessarily in, in this community, but 
uh, uh, tactics is, is focused on, a, on, on the means to achieve a goal and the strategy is deciding what the goal actually should be. Oh, yeah. yeah I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think that can definitely be a good analogy here. Hey, Akash, one quick question. Could you talk a little bit more about the modularity and composition? Because when you said that, my mind immediately thought of the like skill-focused bullet points. So like, can you just talk about what the like what these neural network modules are? Are they like, you know, estimating the value function or is it like the policy network or like what, what exactly is being composed here? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So I think usually based on what I, what I read, um, each module, like the most explicit way is like if you have a series of tasks, you have like a module for each. And then you, when you see a new task, you can learn how to, you can figure out how to kind of compose these to solve that new task. Um, that's like, kind of a very explicit way of doing it. And usually that's done on the policy network, not like the value network. Um, Got it, okay. Another, another thing is like, I, I, I read a recent paper where it's like soft modular, modularization where you don't have like explicit modules, but you just have like different sub networks that are activated for certain settings. And then you need to figure out if you're in a new setting, like what sub networks are most relevant to solve that. So I thought that was like pretty interesting as well. Okay. Does that cool. make sense? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. It reminded me of some work, but I can't you know, pinpoint exactly which. Of uh, a work? Yeah, I, I'm just joking. I mean, it okay. reminds me of dendrite. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And I can go back to that if, if there's any additional questions. Um, and the last last point they they last kind of umbrella they they mention is a uh, meta learning approach. So the first is uh, context detection, which is very specific to reinforcement learning, I think. So this kind of goes back to the view that the MDP is stationary, so it's like the, the physics are fixed, but the agent can't fully observe the true state. So this this uses the notion of a task state, which is like the un unobserved part that the agent has to kind of develop a belief about in order to act optimally. So it needs to determine, okay, like what I think the task state is, which is what the authors call it, in order to act, um, act to optimize my reward. So there's a lot of like theoretical work on like how you can reformulate like the actual MDP into um, an MDP that explicitly models the task state. And then the agent has to kind of learn to develop beliefs about this. And um, the, the word context detection is focused on, okay, discovering these task states. And uh, once you've discovered them, kind of uh, acting optimally. And I think a lot of work has focused on like, kind of a Bayesian perspective on this and like developing a belief on what the task state could be. Uh, another kind of related view is like, okay, um, how to detect points or boundaries where the task or distribution that the agent is observing kind of switches. So the, the authors call it this change point detection. So um, kind of automatically figuring out, okay, this is a point in which um, the task has switched or like the, the environment dynamics have kind of moved from one regime into another. Um, so this, this other bullet point, learning to adapt, is more of like a classic meta learning perspective where the, the agent has to actually learn the optimization process to adapt quickly to a new setting. So if it transitions into a new setting, how, does, how should the agent update itself in order to better adapt? Um, so this, the classic meta learning approach where there's like two loops, an inner loop for like fast adaptation in a new setting and an outer loop that is determining, okay, how do I learn to learn. So like, how do I actually update this inner policy to um, better adapt it in new setting? And the last one, um, which I think is really cool, is like learning to explore. So exploration is a big part of research in RL, where you need to learn about the world. Um, and from that learning, you figure out how to act optimally. So uh, there's a lot of research on kind of unsupervised exploration. So uh, defining something called like the agent's curiosity, 
um, which encourages it to kind of go into different areas of the environment based on a pattern of like what it can control and versus what it cannot control. And there's also other notions such as like empowerment, um, which kind of touch upon um, what the agent can directly influence and things like that. Um, and I think these kind of three buckets, they don't exist in isolation. I think ideas from one can be, take, can be used in ideas used in other. So for example, like learning to explore could be like used as a pre-training phase for like skill, skill-based or goal-based learning. Um, so I think these buckets are not like in isolation. Make the same observation I made earlier. There's a, it's even worse. There's so many different techniques you just went through here. It's it's again surprising, and and it just tells me that this is. It seems like it's so far away from like sort of reaching a consensus on what. I mean, you must have gone through twenty different um, methods of people using for this, um, and that's it. Just seems like a that's a a, a temporary state of confusion. Or whatever it feels like to me. I think the way I think about it is that um, kind of like from a human perspective, we do all of these things. Um, and like maybe each one is like an aspect of having a like true continual learning agent in like a embodied setting or something like that. Yeah, I mean, if you think um, like the brain, right? We, you know, the, mm -hmm. the brain does sometimes solves all these problems and I can't be certain about every one of them, but. And, and yet there's a common methodology. We don't have one part of the brain doing this and another part of the brain doing that. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a core algorithm, which is very, very flexible that does almost all these things. And, um, but here, I, I don't get, I mean, yeah, yeah, you could say, well, they're not completely separable. You could use a curiosity thing for something else, but it just, it, it just again, I could be wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like this has not coalesced yet. Um, um, you know, there's, it's a it's hundred different approaches to solve a hundred little things, but it, 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 we're missing the big picture, it feels like. It, it, these have to consolidate into some sort of Uber policy or Uber methodology of, of learning, um, ultimately. And we know the brain has done that, um, and we know a lot about the piece of it. So I'm, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just surprised at how many different approaches there are here. <laughs> Right, and I think like it's true. This is true in like a lot of machine learning, so like computer vision, right? Like there's like people that focus on segmentation and like edge detection and classification and like object tracking. So like, but and they they kind of tackle each of these independently, whereas the brain kind of does this all. Yeah, that yeah, and that, and that to me is always a sign that well, it's not right. You know, um, you you can attack if you have to attack each little piece separately, then you don't have the right approach. That somehow this. They've got to get united. Um, and anyway, it's I, I'm not being critical. I'm just pointing out that that's wow, I was impressed, amazed that there's so many different types of things, ways people are going about this. Yeah. And, but th this variety is not just in terms of methods, but also in terms of how you define the problem. And this connects back to the presentation that Michelangelo gave last week that we're discussing. You know, uh, there is a lot of confusion right now in how do you define the continual learning problem. And that's the same here in reinforcement learning. So we are talking about different algorithms, but each one of those algorithms solves a slightly different continual learning problem. We don't have consensus on that yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and this is what kind of the next one touches on. It's like a big challenge right now is like, okay, there's no good established benchmarks and evaluation metrics for continual RL. So um, you need like benchmarks that kind of ramp up in difficulty. So um, what, what are the sources of non-stationarity? How do tasks evolve? So it's kind of hard to come up with simulation environments that, um, that touch upon this. So like what people have done now is like have like video game settings where there's like different levels. So the agent may, might have to like progressively update itself in changing scenarios where the scenarios are like what level it sees kind of like a Super Mario Bros. You can kind of think of it in that way. Um, or a robotic manipulation challenges where there's different types of objects that the robot has to kind of deal with or um, has to, the robot has to like do certain things to certain objects or place them on a shelf or turn a knob or like insert one object um, into like a box or something like that. 
Um, and the authors do explicitly point out that embodied AI is like a promising area for um, continual learning because it's multimodal. There's different sensory inputs. Um, it's, there's like different things that the agent could do within this embodied well, Why do they associate embodied AI with multimodal? I mean, sure, but embodied AI is, is valuable for a single modality. Um, is that, is it, they do not see it that way? Well, I think um, like this is more of like a, I, I agree with you that it's like unique for a single modality, but the multimodal aspect of embodied AI is more unique to it right now. Mm. Like you have different, you have touch, um, like yeah. vision, hearing yeah. maybe. You know, it's, it's, it's um, this will be a review for us hopefully, but I'll just say for, for the record to make sure. You know, this idea that a vision is a modality is, is false. You know, vision is thousands of, of sensors. Touch is thousands of sensors. Um, they're moving independently. You can say, well, the ones in the retina are moving independently, but they could in theory, but in this case or not, but touch, they are moving independently. And, and so there, you know, even vision is not one, in one sense, you could call it one modality, but from the brain's perspective, it's just thousands of sensors that are moving. And, and each one is building its own model. Well, that's a thousand brain theory. So um, I just think this way of thinking about it is incorrect. Um, uh, and I don't, you know, clearly the AI world hasn't come to understand that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I stayed in my case. Yeah. Um, and then like metrics, so like measuring how how good or bad like the level of catastrophic you're getting is. Um, so this this could be something like kind of uh, training, having the agent go back to a task it hasn't seen in a while and then seeing how it performs, or um, it's still a problem of like, how do you actually explicitly model this maybe? Uh, skill reusability is another, another idea that the authors touch upon is like, if you take the skill-based or like macro action versus micro action, perspective, how well do these macro actions, how often are they reused across tasks and how, how adaptable are they? And can they be composed into, uh, and to solve like a more complex, complex task? And um, also like how, how does the agent plan in the environment that it's in? So these, these last three, I think there aren't like a consensus um, way of measuring those. So it's kind of an open, open question still. And lastly, how do you, uh, how does the agent generalize to out of distribution tasks or in um, aspects of the environment that it sees? One, one metric, which is not there, we've seen in supervised learning is uh, forward transfer and backward transfer. And that mm -hmm. might fit into a skill we use a bit. That just means uh, whatever I learn now can help in the future task or whatever learning a future test can actually help that's that I learned before. So it's not just about cat catastrophic forgetting. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that's definitely like an aspect or like a way of thinking about skill reusability and like general kind of continual learning. Um, and the, the, the kind of the paper kind of uh, has a section at the end that does touch upon how ideas from neuroscience can be brought into continual reinforcement learning. So um, like studying how the brain um, addresses like stability versus plasticity through credit assignments. So like associating certain parts, certain parameters or certain experiences as having more credit for like higher rewards or something like that. Um, so yeah, one, one uh, idea here is like, which experiences can the agent use to assign credit to meaningful actions? Uh, how does the brain structurally address this? So this is not, this point is not specific to like reinforcement learning. This one is so um, like, what is the reward signal that humans optimize for? This is kind of, I think there's some research here that I'm not super familiar with, but still like an open question. Um, how can we build algorithms that better incorporate like better model how human memory and human replay happen? So the authors, point some papers that talk about how like um, dreaming during sleep for humans is like super important for kind of consolidating experiences and consolidating like certain actions as like more 
uh, as more like ingrained within the human's like way of acting. Uh, how does the brain combine model free and model based learning? So there's like evidence that both is occurring in the human brain, um, but it's not yet clear how it's combined. Um, so like figuring out how the brain does this can be helpful in building better algorithms. And um, does the brain exhibit modular structure where there's different modules that do different things and there's like a different aspect of the brain that determines how to compose these to solve certain problems. So I think these are exciting um, questions to ask and I'm sure like some, like hopefully we can incorporate some of these when we're trying to solve certain of these uh, continual RL problems. And yeah, this is the last slide, so. Um, this, this is the kind of list that someone who doesn't know a lot of neuroscience would write. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, the way the brain can inform us is, you know, is not that these sort of, I mean, these are not bad things, I'm not saying that, but, but they're very fuzzy. You know, how can we incorporate better human memory and replay? Well, to understand human memory is not, you have to really get down to the details, exactly. Uh, the kind of stuff we do at Nementa. Um, but if you focus on these sort of very sort of uh, you know, the studies about your sort of, that are not detailed studies, they're sort of uh, you know, you're testing animals in certain environments, testing humans and so on, you're just not gonna get there. Anyway, so, you know, uh, it's just, I think this is a role for us to play. I don't think, I don't think this kind of list is really the right. I mean, asking the question of the brain exhibit modular structure, well, there's a hell of a lot that's known about that. It's not, it's, not, it's not like an open question. It's like, you know, you, 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 gotta, you have to spend months reading papers to understand that. Anyway, I, again, not trying to be critical, I'm just, point, critical, I'm just pointing out that I think this level of acknowledgement of neuroscience is very shallow in some ways. Um, but that's not surprising because this is what we do and, and there's very few other people do it. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, it's the, there's a lot to unpack here and explore. One thing you mentioned is uh, about dreaming. Uh, and uh, you hear that a lot. Oh, well, dreaming is about replaying memories and, and learning from them. Is, is that uh, established, uh, established concept in neuroscience? Because I've, I've heard recently a different interpretation. I think it's from uh, David Eagleman saying about how dreaming is about keeping the connections of the, the visual pathway uh, strong because when we're sleeping, you know, your eyes are closed and other connections would take over. So dreaming is a way of, you know, just helping those visual pathways. Yeah, really, uh, that's true. that was an interesting hypothesis. Although the way, one way to look at dreaming is just take dreaming out of the picture. Say you have a human or an agent, an animal and say, what can it do during the day? It's not sleeping at all. It can form new models of the world. It can act on everything. It can do all these things. Absolutely everything we're talking about here. Um, and, and you don't need the dream, right? So you, from that point of view, you can say, well, something's going on here where I can learn all these things. I can learn new skills, I can do this. Now, maybe somehow the consolidation over long-term has to occur during the dream and something like that. But the mechanisms that for all the things we can do are there without dream, without sleep. And so, uh, and most of the theories of sleep, and I'm not an expert in this at all, but most of the theories of sleep have to do with other things, um, you know, cleaning up junk in the brain, reestablishing connections, uh, you know, chemical processes, who knows. But, but you can just say to yourself, well, I can, you know, over, over a 20 hour period, I can do all these things and I don't get sleep. So sleep is not an absolute requirement to perform these functions. It's, it's gotta be a supplementary to it. So that's why we've, ne we've never really focused on sleep when I'm working because it doesn't seem to be necessary. To, it's necessary for, for an animal. Um, and it's still somewhat of a mystery why but it's certainly not necessary for, um, uh, for all the sort of the learning tasks and inference tasks and, and goal planning tasks that we, we want to deal with. Does that, did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Do you think well, one day we could go without sleep? That would be interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, it, clearly animals need sleep and it seems to be pretty universal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, there's animals that have to, who like, Animals have to swim all the time, and they show them that half their brain sleeps while the other half is awake, and then they swap turns. You know, it seems to be a universal thing that brains require. So I'm not sure with, with humans we'll ever get away from it. Um, but I just don't think it's an essential quality for 
all of the information processing tasks we're thinking about for AI. Um, at least, you know, it, you certainly can get very, very far without it. You know, it's not like, well, I cannot learn anything until I sleep. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> you continue learning all day long. So, um, you know, you know, I don't know. It's still mostly a mystery. I feel like it's also kind of interesting with sleep how, um, Obviously, the, the kind of evolutionary pressure to be able to eliminate the need for sleep is enormous, or, or like the, the advantage if an organism was able to not yeah. have to sleep would be so huge. So it's just interesting that um, it's persisted despite that. Yeah. It kind, yeah. Of, it kind of shows yeah. how fundamental uh, it is for, for whatever purpose it serves. And, that, and that's what they show pretty much every animal the brain sleeps, you know, and even and it comes, you're right, it's, a, it's amazing how preserved that is. Um, so it must be really, really fundamental, but it doesn't, again, that could be very fundamental to the biology of the brain, just like oxygen is, and, you know, and glutamate or, you know, these are fundamental things brains have to have. It doesn't mean that it's, it's a fundamental, the information processing um, of the brain. And it's certainly evidence which suggests that it's not for almost every kind of thing we think about, because we can do that all while we're awake. Um, it's, it's something else going on. And I'm Eagleman's curious, proposal was pretty interesting, so. I'm kind of curious if for animals that are uh, uh, divorced from a diurnal cycle, like in caves and, and things like that, are they required to sleep as well? Uh, I don't know, but I, I think any animal with brain sleeps, <laughs> I think that's, that's the rule I think I've read. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, fish sleep. And what if you're a fish down in the dark depths of the ocean? They sleep. So. Fish, fish that swim continuously sleep. Birds that, birds that fly continuously sleep, but they only sleep half the brain at a time. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, me a method that evolution discovered like, oh, you can stay awake all the time. Just half your brain has to sleep, <laughs> then the other half sleep. So uh, imagine that would be the strategy for any, anything that doesn't really have an obvious plan to sleep. Yeah, I was just, I mean, <clears throat> just wondering how much the uh, it was locked the dinosaur cycle that when it got dark that it says, well, it's how how to efficiently conserve energy just you that, know, go to that's, sleep. Yeah, that was a hypothesis that that I think is pretty well somewhat discredited. Okay. Um, um, you know, it, it, I, I'm not again. I don't know that all the literature on this is not even close, but they've come up with other reasons that show like, nope, you know. <laughs> It's not, it's not a way of reducing energy. It's a way of, you know, there is a fundamental need that brains have to do something chemically while you're sleeping. And uh, there's, I, I think there's some recent research on it which is pretty good about like, cleaning up these toxins in the brain and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I, can, I can believe, you know, the, the, the toxin theory, but okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, it would be nice if like half my brain was the bug in my cold while I sleep. That <laughs> feels so much more productive. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It is crazy what sleep does. Well, um, who knows if our brains weren't uh, uh, so dimorphic? Maybe that could be done. 